Welcome back, listeners. I'm going to be a little vulnerable here with you today and share that we've had some pretty incredible guests across the two podcasts. And I think today's guest has made, no, he has not done anything. Reading through today's guest bio has left me feeling uh, quite humble, quite um, overwhelmed with her capacity and her endurance and her ability to take the challenge. And it's left me feeling uh, a little overwhelmed, I want to say. And so I'm probably not going to do a lot of the talking today, which is what this podcast is meant to be about, somebody else sharing their story. I'd like to introduce you to an amazing woman who the short five-minute chat that we do before we actually press record uh, has already unlocked an idea for our business so that we can help one of our members. Uh, We've spoken about one of our members that we can put in touch with her and will lead to some other amazing opportunities and has been warm and welcoming, maybe super comfortable, even though I might be nervous, lethal. Thank you so much for being here and joining me today. You are all the work. It's my, my job to interact with people and do, make the most what we can out of life. Isn't that the truth? It's something that I think that we forget that we're doing. We we tend to be so subconscious in how we come up against or, or meet and interact with other people. So I think it's a fantastic place to start, Lisa. We'll just go straight into it. But we won't. I'd love you to tell us a little bit about you and what has happened in your life prior to this point that led you to be talking to us here on the podcast today? Other than that, so the big old convoluted story, I think started at the old boarding bridge where I moved to New Zealand when I was three months old and lived for seven years in a caravan day made off the grid. So pretty alternative, eight rock hill, didn't really go to school till we moved back to Australia when I was seven. Um, we lived in a boat shed, boat shed on um, Lake Macquarie, one of my grandfather's boat shed. We are really poor family, lived in rented houses. I was the able-bodied kid who was into sport, like this skinny as a beanstalk. Played every sport I could to get out of class. Went sailing every afternoon on other people's boats. Played netball, rep netball, until I was introduced to basketball. Came and said, Mum, I'm giving up netball, I'm taking up basketball. And loved basketball and played rep basketball at school. Really had no clue what I wanted to do in my life. Enrolled, started off at uni, did a law degree, which then changed into an arts degree and popped out with a science degree. I wanted to be a town planner, but I went and worked as a town planner over the summer and really hated what was going on in the environment. And so I thought, I'll just do teaching, it'll be handy later in life. But in the meantime, two days after my last exam in second year uni, I was riding my mountain bike home from a parents' place and I put a poor we rode our bikes everywhere um, and swerved over the wrong side of the road. My bike hit the gun, I somersaulted over the handlebars and fell down about, I think about three metres into a driveway that was parallel to the road and landed on my bottom with a little vertebrae in my back sort of collapsed and my L1, which is belly button height, absolutely disintegrated. And I was really lucky. I was found by an old mate, well, sorry, I have to say a senior lady, now that I'm going to go parliament, senior, <laughs> um, whose daughter was a nurse and she lived over the road and the nurse came and said, is there any tingling in your hands or feet? And you know, when you get your bunny bone, you get that sensation. I had that through my legs. So straight away, I was identified as a spinal cord injury. I continued Castle Hospital where they took one off at the x-ray. Helicopter to Sydney, went in for a big operation and woke up off the painkillers. Probably about two weeks later, they kept being really sedated to be told at 19, I was never going to walk again. I was going to be kind of on my back and bench for two months in a hospital for six months and use a wheelchair for the rest of my life. So that was sort of the start of a wham, bam, life-changing moment. Mm. Uh, I didn't have a helmet on. It was before helmet days. Really not sure if helmet would have made any difference because I had like land on my bottom, but definitely a helmet would have protected me if I landed on my head. Mm. Um, and then when I was in a hospital, they they said, oh, would you like to try wheelchair basketball? And in 1988, November 27, I remember remembers the day of their accident, um, they I said, do you want to try wheelchair basketball? And no one even knew what a Paralympic was back then in 88. And then these two really buff wheelchair users came into the hospital and were like, oh, cool, that's cool. Do you want to come to wheelchair basketball? And by the time I got up again, I had this big ugly back brace on with Velcro straps on the side and they took me out to Mount Truett, which is a, what I perceived from my innocent upbringing, a rough place in Western Sydney where I ended up teaching for five years. Wow. I went to this stadium owned by Wheelchair Sports New South Wales and I just wheeled in. I just saw this people in wheelchairs having fun and going fast and they had cars and jobs and lives and studying and boyfriends and girlfriends. I thought, oh, this is actually not going to be too bad. And because I already knew the rules of basketball, what actually happens with lots of people with catastrophic 
accidents as far as sport goes. They come into a new sport sort of at age six level, but because I knew the rules, I just mm-hmm. had to drive a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And the girls were excited. I made was invited to play for New South Wales, and it wasn't too long. I was invited to try it for Australia, and then this is a nutshell speed journey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and selected to compete in the Barcelona Paralympics. We came seventh in what the next one. Atlanta, we came fourth. City 2000 was amazing because it's in front of the home crowd. We got yeah. a silver, backed it up with another silver in Athens and a bronze in Beijing and then changed sports to sailing um, after doing the Sydney to Hobart and won a gold in London and a gold in Rio. And that was, so that's the journey. And then in the meantime, when I changed sports from basketball to sailing, I wasn't driving to Sydney three nights a week for training. So I joined the Labor Party because I athletes are really selfish and I just wanted to give back to my community. Never in a school in years imagined I'd become a member of parliament. But when the local member of parliament's letter came to say that she was resigning because she was unwell, I intuitively knew my life was going to change. Plus, sailing was a sport that was taken out of the next Paralympics so that the pumpy sports get in and the sports that aren't growing get pushed out. Sailing was out. And so I put up my hand up and now I'm a member of parliament in the New South Wales parliament and been opposition for six years and now we're in government which is just unreal that's got, that's a crazy short summary i've never done it in that quick one before no that is the best <laughs> summary i think we've ever, you've just blown everybody else out of the water i am just blown away by what you have created through a situation that most people would just fall into the deep despair that would naturally come with that kind of catastrophic injury and i'm really interested to understand how you were able to shift your mindset set Liesl it must have been really like to wake up and be told at 19 that kind of devastating news I I can't even understand how you first process that information and then how you get to the point where you think you know what I'm going to go and play basketball yeah yeah no it just it just was I don't know and I just wonder like we grew up and said Paul you did lots of rental properties we had to deal with all this change and like living in caravan change 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 you wonder if that's got something to do with it plus Mm -hmm. I was in Sydney and my family and support network were in Newcastle, but it was unreal. Like I, I through the Petadine haze, the number of people that came down and spent time with me and supported me there, I really felt like I was absolutely supported regardless of what was going on in my body. Mm -hmm. I was intellectually and emotionally really, mum gave up her job and came and lived in the nurses' quarters. Like I was absolutely supported and the staff in the hospital were just unreal. Like I had a role in the hospital. I was, like we all had to lie in bed flat on our backs. I had a, little foam ball and I got the flat ribbon from my thousand I used to shove all these in a cup with the foam, wedge the foam ball I used to peg it because everyone else had a broken back as well so I just had to lie there these days they put um rods and things in people's backs but we just had to wait so I just just peg the lollies around the ward like I just had a good time and then I think and then I was also really determined and I think I was also really lucky a lot of people have their injury at a different time of life I was really at a forward at stage so I wasn't I wasn't a builder and I wasn't a lawyer and I wasn't a teacher. So I really still had a pathway that it didn't, my identity wasn't changed. Like I was a wheelchair user, but my my workplace identity, so many people attach it, were really not that flexible about that, wasn't changed. So I was really able to evolve my, myself as a human being and adapt to an identity. I thought I was going to be an environmentalist off the front of the railway warrior, but we have got a wheelchair and maybe that doesn't work too well. So no. I did... I did teaching because I thought it would be handy later in life and got a targeted graduate position in the accessible school, which in my rep basketball time, like I put a gym into each of the schools that I taught in. I had a basketball training before school every morning. Like I was so enthusiastic. I remember one day I went down to train early in the morning and the cleaner didn't come in and no one else came in. And then I realised I was training and it was Saturday. I didn't even have to go to work. <laughs> so so I, I'm taking from that, you just kind of focused on the next thing rather than being focused on what was behind you because the injury is behind you. Yes, it's going to impact your everyday life. It's really, I think well, that's, I don't know, that maybe that's how I've always lived, but like when the job that I've been now, you can't do anything about what's happened. You can only make improvements for a future. And my job really is the moment. Like I can't do anything about tomorrow's calendar until I get to tomorrow. Yeah. Like I can do the preparation I need to do, but I can't change what's happening. So it's just got to be like, it's really about today and now and what we can do at this moment to be the person we want to be and do the work we want, put the things in place that will make the difference for tomorrow. That's incredible. 
but also the life of an athlete, like the work you have to do, like the power of on every four years, but you have to do the work today because you're committed to something that's in the future. But it's the work that you do today that really is the stuff that makes the difference in the future. Can we talk about that preparation, Lisa? Can we? Can you help us understand? Like that's quite, I think, a foreign concept for lots of people unless they've been involved in the sports or unless they have a goal that they're working towards. And most of us don't. We, we can be quite absent-minded around what we're doing or our goal might be quite loose like oh I want to pay off the house there's no boundary around that of when it might happen it's just I'm working to pay off the house when you have something like the Olympics coming up you you have a very defined hard deadline of when you need to be ready for so that's obviously then needs to frame out what the preparation looks like for you can you explain that process it's interesting and one guy came and did a PhD study on me very early in my career and talked about a periodized training program, which you know, which is absolutely the normal thing to use in sport now, which is actually looking at, yeah, winter and summer and when the sporting season so on and then when you need to do your muscle training, when you need to do your fitness training and where you fit that other thing. And I think also another important thing for me has been writing those goals down. Yeah. And I've got, like, I've got, an encyclopedia of training diaries that one day someone will go, oh, we need to do a study on this one. We just kept playing sport and playing sport and playing sport. But I've got such a huge collection of training diaries of just putting those incremental goals. Like I said, the paying off the house is something that will happen in 25 years. Mm. But what's going to happen this month and next month and this year? And what does that little reward look like? What does that big feel look like? Mm. I'm not actually I even said to one of my colleagues the other day, at the end of the school year, I used to write myself a Christmas card with the good work I've done at school because nobody really cared what they do. But I knew, like, I worked hard and I want to make a difference in kid life, so I just write myself a Christmas card. That's fantastic. Thanks for, your doing, thanks for doing your stuff because I'm a bit of a writer down Yeah. Actually, actually, if you look in the desk in front of me, there's, like, it's always got lots of, lots of ideas on post-it notes in various shapes and forms and chaos written down. I absolutely love the acknowledgement of where we've been. It's something that none of us consciously do frequently enough. Um, we built stuff into our coaching program for that exact reason, for the, the opportunity for acknowledgement. How did I go this month? Did I achieve what I set out to achieve? If I fell down somewhere, what can I do to improve it for next month? Or I achieved all of that. Or was I able to even push forward and do a little bit more? Or did I just manage to hang on by the skin of my teeth? And that's okay sometimes. And I think that that, that opportunity for reflection is something we deny ourselves. And yet we're all working so hard every day in this thing called life to get where we would like to go, but we don't acknowledge what we're doing along the way. Absolutely. Take, take some time to write yourself a little Christmas card. Or what I actually thought of it in the context of the Member of Parliament now I'm writing stuff down about, you know, like these are the things that I've ticked off along the way. And I'm also a, a obsessed saver of any gratitude. Like in, as a member of parliament, sometimes people forget to have too much gratitude, but we've got a gratitude wall, I've got a gratitude trouble, I've got a gratitude file, just because on those days. And this comes through sport as well. Mm-hmm. We used to take something that was really good and that you're doing in sport, and you'd, if there was a moment or a really good training session, you'd take that and you put your hand and put it in your pocket. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of days where you don't have those really good things and you've got to remember that your pocket is really filled up with amazing things that you've done along the way in your trade, running your business, in your house, run, bringing your kids up, in your netball, wherever you're doing those additional things. Your pocket is actually really full of amazing contributions that you've got to hold on to when the days are a bit darker. Well, that's that's You were dropping all of the gold today, <laughs> like an Olympic champion should. Lisa, you are not just an Olympic champion, you're a champion of the people. And I feel as though that is what has led you to the opportunity that you now have as a member of parliament. Can you talk to us a bit about, um, I guess, your journey with where you've come from? I mean, clearly you were living with some some lack when you were a child. With your parents, it was um, a a different upbringing than many of us have experienced, perhaps not privileged in some ways, and I would suggest very privileged in some other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and generally not the kind of privilege that uh, in everyday society now we look at and, th- and consider to be privileged, and yet it's the elusive stuff that most of us are actually working towards, time, balance, <laughs> spending lots of that with all our loved ones. Things in life and nature. Yeah. 100%. And yet we, we, we come about that in some very challenging ways, that's for sure. And you're, I'd really just like to understand how, I don't know that we can even unpack this in the half an hour that we have. You you, you have a, an amazing mind that's apparent to me very quickly. 
not only uh, did you come through what others would typically call a, a more challenging childhood, um, a less stable childhood perhaps in some ways. I just really want to acknowledge in some ways this is just what the general public perhaps would be thinking. You've then gone through the most catastrophic event that would happen to most of us uh, and come out of the, the other side as a champion, as I said, <laughs> not just an Olympic champion, but a champion of the people. You have this real connection to people and uh, you also then have the ability to re-reflect that back to them. But I, th- I would suggest at at a larger point as well within what you're doing within Parliament, you're reflecting back the amazingness that is people so that we can open the doors to some other opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you feel that has worked for you? Maybe a bit of an ambiguous question. Yeah, no, I'll just feel really complimented by those lovely words. I said before, you don't get all the compliments too often when you're in this job, but I just feel, yeah, I think the privilege I've had of living in Australia with this injury and the opportunity I've had as in the sporting nation, even someone with a disability, like back in the old days, we weren't that recognised. But I think Sydney 2000 was an absolute tipping point having the Paralympic Games. And I think people said, is there something what's wrong with that lady? We packed the kids. Like previously in Barcelona or Atlanta, we didn't, the stadiums weren't full. So we opened up and I was part of the education program to have a ticketing program where 20 bucks got you in the gate. So every single game was in front of packed house. And instead of saying, what's wrong with that lady? The kids said, What's, what does that person play? Yes. So all of a sudden, there's a shift from disability to ability. Yeah. I think that's, that's I don't know, like subconsciously, that's a really beautiful lift for people who were, were disabled. Like, yeah. Say. yeah. So we've been, we really have been part of like a privileged part of Paralympics. We've been part of Australian sporting world culture. I haven't really thought about it like this, man. You're making me go deep on the insult. <laughs> but, but also in that sporting background, like I said about the things you put in the pocket. When I first started playing, we didn't have an National Women's League. So we got together a whole bunch of them. We made a National Women's League and that's sort of going strong. So that's in our pocket of goodness. And then the other thing you realise, I've got, I'm a person with a disability and especially through Sydney 2000, we had a voice. We had to go and promote this games to people. Mm-hmm. So we got people in there. So I've got a voice to be able to talk about the games and a platform, which then gave me a voice. And then you realise as a high school teacher, you've got a disability and you're actually advocating for a lot of more people with other disabilities because all I really know about is paraplegia. So I've done a master's in special ed for advocating for people with intellectual disabilities. Yep. And you realise it's a bigger conversation about inclusion in society. And it's not just like when, when there's inclusion of people with disabilities, inclusion of the LGBT community, inclusion of Aboriginality. It really makes me feel warm and fuzzy when I see any aspect of disadvantaged section of the community being included. And so to... To be, when I put my hand up to run for parliament, I just sort of, and I did sort of a whole bunch of door knocking. Only three people said, oh, but you can't do that because you're in a wheelchair. But because I was already Paralympian, I was like, oh, yeah, like there was no question that I can do it. So to come into the parliament as a wheelchair, is it's like, oh, bloody hell, the parliament's not very accessible. The bloke looks down his nose at me and says, oh, it's the oldest parliament in Australia. <laughs> and there's a lady in that chair over there and I'm going to be covered in this parliament. I'm still fighting about access in the parliament. But I think that the, the conversation is the privilege of her being an athlete and being in the spotlight that I had has given me a voice to to take on and be brave enough mm-hmm. to be the voice that not that many people with disabilities actually can't. Lisa, why do you think that we're still battling so much to have comprehensive comprehensive inclusion? No. <laughs> the big question. Okay. Ready? So, and it's I'm doing quite a lot of work. I'm now called a, well, my call a, a regional champion of parliamentarians with disabilities. And this is about, like, I just got elected because um, I'm me, not because I've got a disability. Yeah. But, but trying to get more people into political parties with disabilities and trying to get more people into parliaments across the Commonwealth with disabilities because we are 20% of the population. Mm. And we don't have leaders. And that's what I said, like, it's really important. We're all models. Where's the role? Like, it's fantastic. You know, we've got Kurt Fanley, we've got Dylan Alcott, um, we've got Maddie Di Rosario, because you've got to see it to believe it and you've got to be it. And then where are the people with disabilities on our boards, where yes. with disabilities that are in our mainstream advertising around that we'd see Dylan on the bill, whatever, but we haven't historically seen that. No. And all have we had inclusion in schools on the same level that we have? So in Canada, we've had. Um, much more inclusion in schools starting from the 70s. So in Canada, there's much more inclusion in the workforce as well. So I actually believe the kids and 
the kids that were sitting there watching me at the games in 2000 were the kids. And now they're the employees, but they will be the employers of the future. And the kids that are sitting beside kids with disabilities in their classrooms, we have no issues. Like they're not necessarily going to be sitting at the parliament putting through legislation, but they might be making some cup of teas. They might be cleaning the parliament, but they'll have a job as yeah. opposed to just doing some entertainment things that get paid by taxpayers' money just to be entertained. Whereas yeah. uh, human beings, like they participate, people with disabilities can participate in all sorts of ways that we don't give them credit for. But I just think it's a, a social bias that is going to come with time of people seeing, and the NIS has been a great because people with disabilities are now out and about in a way they haven't been before. So we're starting to see, we may not feel comfortable, but we're starting to be with this voice, oh my God, to be interacting and doing stuff in the community, going off all these movies and also hot air ballooning. We've now got a big successful hot air ballooning in New South Wales. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay, you're not getting me up in that. <laughs> it's unreal. You should oh, oh, on the back. <laughs> and nobody tells me it's great. I'm terrified. Lisa, do you ever uh, rub up against some, perhaps I would call it outdated thinking, where you have the opportunity to share perhaps some of your experience and then. How do you do that? Like that would be, it's a point of friction, right? It is. It is challenging, and calling it out is really important. But you do mm-hmm. I mean, even just the the masculinity stuff, like the disability stuff. Like you've got to choose your battles every day, and you can't be having a fight every single day. Yeah, and it's really quite interesting. I hosted when we were going to um, to Canberra for the March for Justice, and then I thought, you know what, I need to have one on the Central Coast. So in about five days, we put together this March for Justice. On the wow. coast. We could only have 500 women because it was COVID thing. We got like 498 women. It was unreal. But, and my beautiful lady who was doing my media at the time, Kajal Bahajas, Fiji and Indian, she's absolutely gorgeous. But she put a little bit about the pale stale male um, conversation in the video. And I got this horrible letter from one of my constituents who wrote to me about what a great job he's doing because he's on the board and he's helping women. Well, uh, it was so derogatory. And I read it and I thought, you know what, I can't write back to him because there's just no words. But I had a conversation with him on the phone and I thought, you know what, sometimes there's a generation that are going to have to pass away. Yeah. Challenging reality is like he ain't got any clue about his privilege and about the position and about the communication. But there's also a lot of amazing men working beside us. And I think that's, that's, and, and also there's amazing members of parliament now, interestingly, People said, you should be the Minister for Disability. No, I should have, because I can be much forceful with every single portfolio. Yes. If, if I just do the wheelchair stuff for the disability, I'm all over there, just the wheelchair lady does wheelchair stuff. No way. The wheelchair lady's got to make sure everybody's inclusive. And and like I said before, like it's about being with people and making the most of every opportunity. And that's sort of, sort of the framework of my life and how I link. Yeah, I can. not necessarily <laughs> answer your question. but yeah. No, that's perfect. It's not a rose blade. But also, I think the experience is... That we have, like in the New South Wales Parliament, I'm in the leg- Legislative Assembly, which is the lower house. There's 93 of us from all walks of life. Mm-hmm. And in you into the Parliament, your experience, people say, oh, so what's it like? I said, it's, I played for five years professionally in the men's league in Spain and Italy and France. Mate, the Parliament's not as wild as playing wheelchair us will get some macho, macho Southern European, I can tell you right now. No, I don't so, actually, wouldn't <laughs> I? I'm sort of prepared, but it still, it does make me a little bit astonished when I look across the other side of the chamber and it really is lawyers in blue suits. Like it yeah. isn't representative. And that's the frustration. I think I joined the Labor Party. We really are a cross section of diversity and we're a fifty percent women, which is the first time in the New South Wales poll, the first time in the federal poll. Like who would think that in twenty twenty three. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, on the front bench. But it's so important that we have a diversity in the poll and people need to think about that when they like it's not something that people think I need to have a of diversity in the parliament, but it's really nice for people in the community to know that person represents me. Yes. And even when I first got elected, I was sitting right in this chair, naive me, answering the phone at seven o'clock at night. You don't do that anymore. I still answer at 5 30 the other night and I've got a person on the floor. Right. But at like seven o'clock at night, a blind man from Orange ran up and said, Thank you for being there in the parliament. Oh, wow. That's so touching. That we got, and it's once again we've got to see it to believe it. I work with a fantastic yeah. Laotian man, a Chinese Australian. I've got it's just fantastic to see diversity and and heroes. Yes, it's for young people where there's role models where you can actually be that in the future. And yeah. I've got you back. Yeah, it's yeah. so important. I agree with you. Yeah, I um, Lisa, I'd like to bring this around to a business mindset. So 
perhaps this is my final question to you today. As business owners, we have the opportunity to create create inclusive workplaces. And I think that thought in itself could be quite challenging to many of our listeners. So I'd love to ask you, how do we create an inclusive workplace? What can we do specifically to ensure that we are being inclusive of the entire community? Ready? First of all, don't be shy about your own situation because a lot of us have got hidden disabilities that we don't have conversations about. And it's really interesting in my role. I meet someone who is now working in the disability sector and talks about this disability who have been discriminated against in their previous life and didn't talk about their disability. There, It's like, let's, let's all be out and open and come to work as our authentic selves. Yes. And if you come to work as your authentic self, it makes it so much easier. And the, I think that the good starting point about being inclusive, lots of us have got members of our family from different backgrounds with different challenges and being true to them and acknowledging their truths, I think is super important. But also not being, not being prejudiced in reaching out when we're employing someone or we're interacting with people. We're human beings in Australia. We're one of the most multicultural countries in the world. Like, don't be shy and get to know people for exactly who they are like I've got, I've got beautiful Han Lee who works in the opposite, comes from a, a Vietnamese background. I've got Nat who's visually impaired, who's amazing with work with Bill Shorten on disability positive who I'm policy, who I met at meditation to start with. And they're now part of my team, which adds so much more. Um, Emily's got a Mauritian background. Like, and it's also really interesting watching people in Woi Woi, which is still a bit white Anglo-Saxon, walk up the front steps of my office when Cardinal was here, Cardinal's... Um, Obviously, quite brown. It's like you can see them rolling their prejudice. But I think, but I'm now educating community about what a future community looks like. And it's not necessarily more work, but that's in much more multicultural parts of the city. And that's it's my job also as a leader to take people on this journey, and and being be the person who's a bit different and not be scared to to give it a crack. Can it be uncomfortable at times? Like as we said before, sometimes you're rubbing up against some really outdated thinking. And so part of your responsibility, I guess, with your role is to try and challenge some of that thing you weak in, as you rightly identified, some of those people just need to pass away because, the, you know, that's not going to change. They're very firm in their thinking. And I can imagine at times it must be quite confronting for you um, as as business owners, even there's opportunity for us to feel uncomfortable. And it's maybe what I'm trying to get to here is it's okay to feel uncomfortable and well, ask absolutely. you the question, how do you manage that when you Definitely. feel like And you know what? Oh, I'm not, we're, we're doing this on a Zoom that's only on the radio, but I'm holding a glamorous leg up where I've got this unglamorous artificial, like a, a <laughs> the, the plastic or body on my leg. I wear built up shoes, which are a little bit uncomfortable. Ask people about it. And it was yeah. interesting. Beautiful Naz Campanella, yep. who's the um, ABC presenter, went in and, that, and she knew it was going to be okay at the interview when the ABC said, What adjustments do you actually need? Love it. What adjustments do you need? Try up the shit. Oh, I actually knew it was going to be great. And not like, oh, well, good. we've got somewhere we can't see. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What adjustments do you need? Like, she's an amazing human being. And people with disabilities stay longer. Yes. <laughs> and added to rest. And, and I might close with this one. One of my mate's girlfriends is a, is mute and she is an animator. And she applied for a job at Disney. And Disney, she got the next level. And she typed in, say, can I do my... Um, next interview by typing because I don't speak. And she said yes, and she's one of the best in the world. She doesn't wow. know how to one. <laughs> the police and that's a job. And then another mate of mine runs an insurance company for um, festivals, a big day out, those things. One of the guys, autistic, he doesn't have to look up any of the old quotes. He remembers them all. Like how yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What a fantastic <laughs> deal. And even, ready, I sailed in the city, the Hobart, with the team who were this belief. The blind sailors by far the best sailors at night. The guys with no legs on the foredeck of the boat smashing through Bass Strait, they had no legs to get washed out from underneath them. The guy <laughs> with four elbows and seven three-quarter fingers, he's a tech guru in the, the navigation. Like it's just, there's no limits. Like we're just human beings. You just yeah. got to give, give, us, give us a go. Yeah, absolutely. We just all need to play to our strengths and concentrate on the strengths that we do have and worry less about the things that we don't. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Lisa Tesh, it has been an absolute joy to spend some time with you this morning. Thank you so much for joining me. If our listeners would love to get in touch and have a chat with you or follow you on social media, where can they find you? Lisa Tesh, MP, member for Gosford, and just Google me, you'll find me, but it's a tricky spelling, L-I-E-S-L-T-E-S-C-H. We'll make sure we've got the same in the lease. And also, don't be scared of reaching out and contacting government. We are your representative. You elect us to represent you. 
So it's actually my job to represent my 60,000 voters in the New South Wales Parliament. And as is everybody across Australia have got members, representatives at local government, state government, also federal government about issues or concerns. And as MPs, we're always asking people to put in community consultation, rah, rah, rah. It's really hard to get people, but don't be shy. It can be grotty dot points, seriously. You could see the email, some people don't know how to use the full stop, but that's fine. We can ring them up and ask them all questions. But please don't be shy of reaching out because it's our job. We are servants to you guys. We are yeah. servants. I wish everybody was as open as you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending some time with me this morning. Listeners, you can find all of the details uh, in the show notes if you'd like to reach out. 